Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Happy 4th of July. Today's video is what I watched in June of 2024. This is where I talk about everything that I saw at the movie theater and also at home on streaming. Now I used to talk about physical media as well, but I think I'm just gonna scrap that part of the segment and going forward, I'm gonna concentrate on what is in movie theaters and also on streaming. So I saw four movies in theaters in June, starting off with Bad Boys Ride or Die. This was such a fun time at the theater. This movie franchise is just getting better and better in my opinion. Martin Lawrence and Will Smith back together have great chemistry. That is undeniable. I also really enjoyed how their characters are growing and evolving with every single movie. And that's very important because in particular with Will Smith's character, because if you don't evolve as a character, what's the point really? So I'm enjoying what's happening with their characters. However, I will say what's going on with Martin Lawrence's character. This is one of the negatives that I'm gonna mention. What's going on with his character with the whole spirituality thing, it was very focused on in the last movie. It kind of continues over into Ride or Die. I'm not really the biggest fan of that storyline. I kind of wish they would kind of just move on from it because it is getting just a little bit ridiculous. The other negative that I have with this movie is that the big baddie villain I saw coming right away. I knew it. I pinpointed it out as soon as I saw the person. I said, nope, you're no good. And I was correct. When the big reveal happened, it's not really that shocking because if you've been watching movies long enough, you pretty much saw it coming a mile away. So those were the main negatives that I have with the film. But if those are the main negatives, then that's really not that bad because this film is full of action. It has a great place setting for the third act of the movie and it was a lot of fun. So I'm looking forward to the next installment. I mean, they're going to make another movie because these films just continue to make money. It's officially a billion dollar franchise. So they're going to continue to make more bad boys film. So I had a great time with this one. And if you haven't seen it yet in theaters, I really recommend that you go and see it. All right. Movie number two in theaters I saw was In a Violent Nature. Now my curiosity about this movie is what drove me to the theater because some people were, it was getting a lot of mixed reviews. A lot of people were saying, wow, it's awesome. There's great kills in the movie. And I will agree with that. Great kills in the film. Some people were knocking it just a little bit. So there was a lot of mixed reviews going on within A Violent Nature. So I wanted to check it out for myself and see exactly what was going on. And I enjoyed the concept, the overall concept, where you have a slasher film from the killer's perspective. Very Jason, okay? It's very re reminiscent of Jason, like Friday the 13th. It's not a carbon copy. I'm not saying that it is, but... There, there's bits and pieces, you know, it's, it, it, there's familiar, familiarity, there we go, there's familiarity there. So it kind of rides that line of like the original Friday the 13th where, you know, the killer's point of view, but we are following the killer as they are going along and, you know, doing his thing, killing people. I don't want to give too much away <laughs> if you haven't seen it yet, but that's pretty much what we're following here. The movie has great memorable kills, I will say that. However, what is totally unbelievable is that when the killer is about to do what he's about to do and the victim sees it coming, they don't try to run. Like, they don't try to run. They don't try to escape. Their reactions are very delayed and it's just not believable because if someone's coming after me with a hook... I'm hauling ass and I'm getting out of there. At least I'm going to try. I don't know if I would succeed because, you know, I'm, I, I'm, 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 I'm not the quickest runner on the planet, but at least I'm going to make an attempt to get out of there. These people don't. For some reason, it's like they go into shock immediately and then they, you know, they meet their demise. So that was a little like, hmm, okay. Well, you're rolling with it and you're with the movie and I'm watching it and I'm going with it. But where this movie severely fails and everyone is saying this, it's the last 10 to 15 minutes of this movie 
where the perspective where we've been following the killer just changes to two women that we've not been following, we're not familiar with at all whatsoever. It changes to these two ladies in a car and they're driving away and a story's being told and we don't care. I don't care about this story. I don't know who you are. I don't know who your brother is. Like, I don't care. And it just, it doesn't make sense. So that's where I think a lot of the negativity about in a violent nature is coming from because if you don't hit the landing with your movie that is what people are going to remember because that's what we remember we remember the very end we walk out of the theater with that moment and if you're not hitting it it's not good so I don't need to own this. I've decided I'm not going to pick it up on physical. This was pretty much a one-time watch for me. I don't need to buy the physical of this. If it lands on streaming somewhere, you know, not PVOD, but if it lands on, you know, who, what studio put this out? I can't even remember. But if it lands on a regular streaming service, if I want to watch it again, I'll watch it there for free. But I'm not picking up the physical because to me, it just is not worth it, unfortunately. If the movie stuck the landing, I would consider it because it's got some great kills. It does. There's one particular like device that the killer uses on some dude and that's pretty awesome. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. But no, I don't think it's worth it. So this one, I was going in with like kind of high expectations, but I was disappointed with the ending. All right, the third movie I saw in theaters was The Bike Riders. And oh man, talk about disappointment. I was so disappointed in The Bike Riders. I cannot even express how much I was depressed, depressed, disappointed. I was depressed and disappointed watching this movie. The reason why I was excited is because I love the TV show Sons of Anarchy. And I thought this movie was going to be like a movie version of Sons of Anarchy. I'm like, yes, a motorcycle club doing illegal activity, you know, doing their thing with gambling and drugs and all that. I'm there, you know, like that's what I wanna see. Then you have the talent on top of that with Tom Hardy and Austin Butler and Jodie Comer. I thought this movie was going to be fantastic. And I walked out bored out of my mind. And I know I'm not the only one. A lot of other people are saying the same exact thing about this film, which is really unfortunate because my expectations were sky high. And now it, it's in the dirt. Like this movie's in the dirt. I'm probably not going to pick up this movie either. I mean, it's if it's offered to me from a studio, yeah. But I would not spend money on this movie. And the reason why is because everything that I was expecting from this film, it was not. This was like the severely watered down version of Sons of Anarchy. This was as if Jax Teller's father in Sons of Anarchy, this is what he really wanted the motorcycle club to be. All legal, not doing anything, not doing anything weird or crazy, just actually being a motorcycle club. But why is that entertaining? It's kind of boring. The most like craziest thing that this motorcycle club did was set a building on fire. That was it. So what are they doing in the movie then? Pretty much the entire film. Austin Butler gets beaten up a couple times. Okay, we'll give you that. There are some fight sequences. There is a tragedy that happens at the end of the movie. I'm not going to say exactly what. I don't want to ruin it just in case. So there's a tragedy that does occur at the very end. But in between... Everyone in the motorcycle club is either hanging out in the bar that they pretty much like just dominate and own or they're outside like having a barbecue pit and, you know, just having a great time outside in the woods. That's it. That's all they are doing. Boring. Boring. I just didn't see the point of why this movie was even made. Now, this was based on an actual true motorcycle club because in the film there is... Oh, I forget his name. Is it Mike Faust? He was in Challengers and he was also in West Side Story, that actor. So he plays the man that follows the motorcycle club around documenting everything for like, I think a decade 
Why? I don't know, because it's not like they're doing anything super crazy and super fantastic. So I'm not really sure why this guy chose this particular motorcycle club to focus on, because like I said, it's not like they're into drugs or, you know, guns or women or anything like that. So I'm not really understanding why this is documented and I don't get why the movie was made, but whatever. I mean, the best part about the movie is pretty much in the very beginning where, you know, Jody Comer is going into the motorcycle club or the, the bar, the hangout for the first, you know, strike that, reverse it. She goes into the bar where the club hangs out at and she sees Austin Butler for the first time at the pool table. If you guys have seen the movie, you know what scene I'm talking about. That was the best part. He looks amazing. He looks fantastic. Like I have seen other people say he looks like James Dean in that shot. They are right. He looks sexy as hell. That's the best part, in my opinion. That is the best part of the entire movie. So, like I said, very underwhelmed, disappointed by this film. And I don't, I don't know. It's definitely not going to get recognized during award season. If it does, it will be a miracle because I don't understand why it would. All right, the fourth, let's move off of <laughs> the bike riders. I'm going on a tangent. Let's talk about the fourth and final film I saw at in theaters, and that was A Quiet Place Day One. Now, I really did enjoy this movie. However, I will say, I think I gave it a three and a half star out of five, and that's because I do prefer the two prior films to this movie. I just think John Krasinski walking away from the director chair was a mistake with this one because he just he made magic with those first two films not saying that this movie is not magical either it, it's its own story but my big problem is that you're setting it in new york city the biggest city in the world or one of the biggest and the story itself just felt very small very small if you've seen the film you understand exactly what I'm talking about. Plus, this is day one. This is day one. The first day that these aliens are crashing down onto our planet like crazy. You've seen the promos for it. They're all over the place, okay? But there is nothing new that we learn about the aliens. Why are they here? What is the point? Why do they want to take over? Nothing. Nothing new is learned. And I thought it was kind of ridiculous and also convenient for the plot line to go along. It was maybe a matter of hours that it seemed like everyone knew you can't make noise with the aliens, otherwise they're going to find you. How do you know that? You know, how do you know that so quickly? Like, that doesn't really make sense to me. I feel like it would take a little bit longer. And then they also knew that if you're in the water, you're safe because the aliens can't go into the water. How do you know that? How do you know that so soon? It was like an hour into the movie and they were saying it. And I'm like, how do you know? I kind of wanted to scream at the screen and say that. How do you know this already? So I understand sometimes you have to, you know, be convenient to make things work in your movie. But I thought that was just a little bit ridiculous. And then there's the cat. Don't get me wrong. I love a cat. I have two. However, the actions of this cat were completely unbelievable. I know it's a service cat in the movie. I'm seeing the comments right now. However, you cannot tell me that this cat would not once during this film and everything going on, this cat would not meow. It would not hiss, snarl, scratch, nothing. This cat made no noise at all whatsoever. It was completely unbelievable. And the most unbelievable part is that there is a section of the film where they have to go into water. I think it's in like the subway scene. They're going into water. The water is rising and they do have to like get in there in the water with the cat, with the cat. And we all know cats do not like water. So you're telling me that this cat was okay with dunking its head for about two to three minutes straight in the water and not making noise? Bullshit. Okay, bullshit. I call bullshit. Like it was just 
too convenient for me. But I'm not completely dogging the film either. There were a lot of great spots and moments in this film, especially because with the two lead characters, you have Lupita, Lupita Nyong'o and Joseph Quinn. These are the two characters that we are focusing on in the film. I love how it was not romantic. I am so sick and tired of seeing you know, movie after movie where you have a male and a female and they're in a desperate situation or something catastrophic happens, let's have sex. You know what I mean? Like, no, no, like that's not, that's not how it needs to go all the time. I'm just so happy that this was a movie about two human beings caring about each other and wanting each other to survive or get to their destined location. Pizza, Okay, <laughs> kind of a weird, awkward destination. However, I can see coming from Lupita Nyong'o's character, I think her name is Sam in the movie. I could be wrong, I could be forgetting. But um, her character, I understand her motivation as to why she wants to get pizza. I totally get it. But pizza, <laughs> really, I, I don't know. This one, it's a mixed bag for me. You know, as you can tell from the way I'm talking about the movie, there were points about the film I really, really enjoyed, but then other pieces were just not believable at all whatsoever. So I enjoyed, overall, I enjoyed A Quiet Place Day One. It is another solid installment. It's not a bad movie. It's not a bad movie at all. But you can just tell that if we're going forward with The Quiet Place franchise, I want John Krasinski back. John Krasinski needs to get back in the director's chair and also writing, write your little heart out and create another story because you can really tell the difference when he's not there. All right, so now I'm gonna move on to streaming. What did I watch on streaming in the month of June? I've got my little list right next to me. All right, starting off with the first Omen on Hulu. So I was completely ignorant to the Omen franchise, but I really wanted to watch the first Omen. A lot of people were talking about it, saying it's a great movie. So I did watch the very first movie with Gregory Peck before I watched the first Omen because the first Omen is a prequel to that movie. So I wanted to be familiar with the connection and when it got there. Honestly, you don't really need to watch the first movie if you haven't seen it. It's not necessary, but I wanted to because I've never seen it before. And let me tell you, the first Omen completely surprised me. I was not expecting this film to be as good as it was. Some of the shots, the cinematography in this film were absolutely amazing. It looked fantastic. Pretty impressive too considering that the director of this movie, this is like the first major project she's ever done. I believe she's done like little bits and pieces here and there, but nothing as major as this like studio project. So this is very impressive and I want to see where she's going to go from here because I thought this movie was so good. Also what was impressive was the leading actress of this movie. Holy crap. I cannot remember her name for the life of me, but there's one scene in particular. It's towards the end. I believe it's when she's getting dropped off from a taxi. And when she leaves the taxi, if you've seen the movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When she leaves the taxi, something occurs where her body starts contorting and making different weird movements. That blew my mind. As an actress, for someone to be able to do that, was mind-blowing. I was like, wow. It really got my attention. I was like, holy crap. I thought she was good, you know, solid throughout the entire film. And then that occurred and I was like, whoa, that stepped it up for me. So I'm looking forward to seeing what she's going to do next because I think she's a great actress as well. So I highly recommend that you watch The First Omen if you've not seen it already. Like I said, stream it on Hulu or it is coming out on physical July 30th, I believe so. The first omen is definitely worth it. All right, next up, Baby Reindeer. Baby Reindeer on Netflix. So this was a show, limited series, that I was hearing about. A lot of It got a lot of buzz. A lot of people were talking about this one. So I finally decided, you know what? Let me binge this. It was like half hour long episodes. Those are my favorite. They're an easy, quick binge. This is the story about a man now, the actor who plays this character 
this is his real life experience. Okay, so he wrote this. This is based off of, I believe, like a stage show that he was doing over in the UK. And then it got the attention of Netflix. And so they contacted him. It's a whole story. So he is playing out his real life story of what happened. So it's all about him being stalked by this older woman. However, what I really loved about the show is that it did not focus solely on the stalking the entire, I believe, eight episodes. There were some episodes that really focused in on his own personal life, tragedies, horrific experiences that happened to him that kind of like molded and shaped him into how he behaved while the stalking was occurring. This is a very interesting story. And I do have to warn you, if you are interested in watching this show, there's one episode in particular. Yeah, one episode in particular. It's not easy to watch, okay? It really is not. Like, this guy went through a very horrific, like, abusive situation with another person that really affected him. And it's not easy, but you know what? I have to commend him as an actor and also telling his, his true life experience because that is not easy to do. He's completely vulnerable by doing this. And I have to commend him for doing that. Much respect to him for doing that. So I really enjoyed watching this show overall. And I hope that he gets recognized during award season because he completely deserves it. Also, the woman that plays his stalker, she was unbelievable. This is the kind of role that actors just want because you can just go crazy and nuts to like, you know, to, to, to the sky and back. And it's never enough. You know what I'm saying? So I just love the way that she performed this role. She was fantastic. All right, next up, Unfrosted. Unfrosted on Netflix. This was Jerry Seinfeld's project about the so-called, like, true story making of the Pop-Tart between Kellogg's and Post. I mean, this movie was just stupid. <laughs> it's just stupid. It's not memorable at all whatsoever. You have Melissa McCarthy in the movie as well. Amy Schumer, Hugh Grant. I feel like a lot of these actors like wanted to do this project because Jerry Seinfeld was behind it and they probably wanted to work with him. That's what I want to assume anyway, because this was just not good. It's it, it's a sugar filled movie. It's forgettable. You don't remember it. You know, it's, it, it, it's here today, gone tomorrow. You know, it just really is not worth. You don't take anything away from a project like this and it doesn't stay with you like with baby reindeer I felt something when I watched that and it really affected me and I still have feelings about it unfrosted an hour later I forgot I forgot about it so it's just one of those really just stupid forgettable projects over on Netflix that you just really don't have to watch unless you're a major fan of Seinfeld and you do want to support his movie I guess watch it but you really don't need to continuing with streaming I did watch the show Sugar on Apple TV plus starring Colin Farrell as John Sugar I love stories like this he plays a detective who's hired by a very wealthy Hollywood family to find the granddaughter that has gone missing the granddaughter has a past with drugs and so everyone thinks that she has relapsed and she's off somewhere but the grandfather knows that there's something wrong. There's something wrong she's missing. So he hires Colin Farrell to find her. Now, I love stories like this. I love like cop, detective, whatever, putting the pieces together and the clues and finding someone. I love stories like that. So this was right up my alley. And I was really with this show. I think it was eight episodes long. And up to episode six, I was all into this show. I thought it was fantastic. It was great. But then something occurs at the end of, I believe it's episode six, if I'm remembering correctly. Something is revealed at the end of episode six. I'm not going to say what it is because if you are interested in watching the show or if you are watching it, I don't want to spoil it for you. But at the end of episode six, something is revealed that just completely, I was like, what? what? <laughs> What's going on here? It completely changed everything for me with how the show was going. And I'm not really sure how I feel about it. I still watched the show. I continued it and I finished it. 
And it's clearly going to get a, a second season. They set it up for it, you know, seamless for a season two. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure how I feel about the reveal in the show. It was just so weird and wacky and what's like out of nowhere. It kind of left me speechless, but I was really enjoying this show a lot until that big reveal occurred. So I don't know. I probably will watch season two because I was really enjoying it, but I don't know how I feel about that wrench like thrown in at me, but I was enjoying Sugar. All right, next up, Bratz. Bratz, the documentary from Andrew McCarthy. I absolutely knew I had to watch this as soon as I heard it was coming out because I'm such a fan of 80s films, in particular with the Brat Pack, those actors. Like, I was just obsessed with all of those movies. I still am. I mean, who isn't? We all love John Hughes movies. But back in the 80s, there was a time period where the Brat Pack name was created and a label was slapped onto pretty much all the actors that were involved in Breakfast Club and St. Elmo's Fire. Those main, those two movies, pretty much. Those actors in those movies. And then kind of like people that were also in John Hughes movies were kind of connected and thrown into that as well. So what's happening in this documentary is that Andrew McCarthy has carried this label of being a Brat Pack member for a very, like ever since he was labeled a Brat Pack member, he's carried it with him for a really long time. And so he was curious to find out if the other members of the Brat Pack were feeling the same way, how they reacted to, to the label, did it affect them at all career-wise or anything like that. So he pretty much has a giant reunion individually with like Emilio Estevez, Ali Sheedy, Demi Moore, Rob Lowe. He pretty much got in contact with everyone except for Judd Nelson and Molly Ringwald, unfortunately. Molly Ringwald just wants to move on, get away from the, from the Brat Pack label. But Andrew McCarthy was able to sit down and talk with all of his former co-stars that he's not seen in like 30 plus years. This was just a really heart, like heartwarming, you know, moving documentary because I love all of these people from those past movies and to hear them talk about it on how being labeled as a brat really affected some of their Hollywood careers, especially with Ali Sheedy when she was talking about her experience going into an audition and people would not give her the time of day because she has that stigma that she's like difficult to work with. She's a brat, so let's not hire her. And that's really unfortunate because all of those actors are just so talented some of them thrived, you know, like Rob Lowe and Demi Moore. They carried on with their careers, no problem. But then other members of the pack, unfortunately, did not continue to have great careers like those two. So this was just a very interesting documentary. The one negative that I would say about it, it was kind of getting very repetitive. You know, like at one point, I'd say it's like an hour and hour and a half documentary around the hour mark. I was kind of feeling it, you know, like, okay, are we going to kind of going to take a different approach to this or something? You know, like I was just wondering, but that was the only negative, the only negative. Like I love seeing Andrew McCarthy again and all of these stars that I love. So if you're a fan of John Hughes movies and all of those actors from that time period, then I really do recommend that you watch Bratz on Hulu. I watched another documentary on Netflix calling Rem called Remembering Gene Wilder. There we go. Remembering Gene Wilder. I absolutely love Gene Wilder. So when I heard that this was coming to Netflix, I absolutely knew I wanted to watch it because he is and forever will be Willy Wonka to me and no one else can take his place. Even though I really enjoyed Wonka with Timothy Chalamet, you know, Gene Wilder is it. You know, he is Willy Wonka. And it was just really interesting to find out more information about Gene Wilder that I was not aware of. It went back into his past a little bit and moved all the way forward, documenting him and pretty much until he passed away. And I just really, really enjoyed this. So if you love Gene Wilder and exploring his career a little bit, then you will definitely enjoy streaming Remembering Gene Wilder on Netflix. And there's actually a physical media release of this as well. 
uh, there's a Blu-ray from Kino Lorber. So if you do want a physical, you can order that online. All right, finally, The Bear. The Bear, season three, over on Hulu. I'm not going to linger and talk forever about The Bear because The Bear is an amazing show. Like, this is one of the best shows on television right now. I binged this show in, I think, three days. It was very easy, half hour long episode, 30 minutes to 40 minutes per episode. This show is so well done. And I think what they did in season three was smart because instead of, instead of focusing on the restaurant itself and how everything goes and flows in a restaurant like we did in the first two seasons, season three focused more in on the emotions of the individuals. There were some episodes that were focused on one particular supporting character and that was it. We got more of their backstories. We got to know them more as characters and individuals which I thought was a great, unique spin. So The Bear continues to be a great show. Absolutely loved it. So that is what I watched in the month of June. So comment down below and let me know what you watched. Don't forget to like and subscribe before you leave and I'll see you next time.